There is nothing magical in this water before there's something magical about what it represents, as it represents the blood of our Christ, who died for us to cleanse us of our sins. Today we have a very special brother. He's no stranger to most of you. You might not know his name, but you'll know the face and you'll recognize the laugh, because when he gets tickled, he can't quit. But there is a joy in this man's heart that is contagious, and he comes today to publicly show you how entwined with the Lord he is and how much he appreciates the fact that he has been cleansed of all his sins, past, present, and future. John Paulette, would you please come in, buddy? John comes today as a grown man, and having known the Lord, known of the Lord for many, many years of his life, and he's been with us for quite some time now, but John has come to a point in his life where he knows Jesus closer than ever. He wants to publicly, through baptism, show who he is, who he belongs to, and what this means to him. And it's so, John, I can't tell you how proud I am to do this. I did tell him, as tall as he is, he's about to bend his knees, and we're both going swimming. <laughs> but, uh, but what a special day for John Paulette. Thank you all his visitors, family, and friends who came for this event today. And boy, they're just peppered all throughout, brother. But today, based on your faith in Jesus Christ and your profession in him as your Lord and Savior, John, it is now my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Well, good morning, church. How are we doing on this uh, on this youth Sunday? But um, yeah, if you guys will please stand uh, for some corporate worship. Um, the words will be on the screen. Um, we introduced this a week or two ago, about so yeah. of Calvary He declares His work is finished He has spoken this hope to me Though the sun had ceased its shining Though the war appeared as lost Christ had triumphed over evil It was finished upon that cross It has been broken Jesus paid the price for me For the pardon he has offered Great the welcome that I receive Boldly I approach my Father Clothed in Jesus' righteousness There is no more guilt to carry It was finished upon that cross one 
once my great opponent Fear once had a hold on me But the Son who died to save us Rose that we would be free indeed Death was once my great opponent Fear once had a hold on me But the Son who died to save us Rose that we finished upon that cross onward to eternal glory to my savior and my god i rejoice in jesus victory it was finished upon that cross it was finished upon that cross it was finished upon that cross. Welcome to Antioch Baptist Church. You might recognize that things just look a little different this morning. Our choir took some youth serum and it worked. Um, so these are, these are our regular choir members, just younger. No, today is Youth Sunday, and because it's Youth Sunday, you don't have to listen to me for a while, and don't anybody say amen, don't you dare. But uh, today, as we do each year, we sort of turn the entire services over to our youth who are more than capable of leading us in worship. We're going to enjoy a message from Pastor Drew in just a few moments. But as we just sort of enjoy what God has given them as talents, let's rejoice and worship together. Before we get started, though, we have a very appropriate presentation for Pastor Drew, our youth pastor. So I'm going to ask him to come up, but I'm also going to ask our Alaska mission team to come up because they're the ones that have the special presentation to make. So, Drew, make your way down all the way to the front there. And you're going to be surrounded by a bunch of crazy men. Um, you may know that we had two mission teams that went to Alaska this past year uh, and just got back, really. And they just think so much of Drew, they just had to do this. So. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank the church for praying for us. Uh, appreciate everybody that was able to give as well. Uh, very very um got a lot done but just want to tell everybody how much we appreciate your prayers and support um this year the guys decided to get each one of our bus drivers that got up real early in the morning and um, take us to the airport be at the church at four o'clock and then also pick us up at the airport at six o'clock in the morning decided to get everybody something special they done that well this year i asked drew i said drew what do you want from the team and he had a special request you like to tell them what it was? Bear skin rugs. Bear skin rugs. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we're in Alaska and we're thinking, how, how can we do this? I mean, we're looking at wolf um, skins, 900 bucks. I was like, man, we can't put that kind of money into it. So one of our um, great members had a great idea. Take it over. Well, uh, as we were walking around, inspiration struck and, you know, Drew did this for us last year, and he made this same request last year. So, um, you know, how can you not? I mean, this guy is up at probably 4 o'clock plus in the morning, so he can pick us up. Uh, last year, we came in super late. We arrived back at the church after 1. Uh, we had to do something for him. So, uh, needless to say, inspiration struck and a little bit of effort back home, and we brought this to present to Drew. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to tell y'all, we were seeing so many bears that he decided to get one and skin it and clean it and all that. But this is close enough. Next but year, we, we might get one for the other foot. Um, <laughs> we actually got him a Ulu pocket knife as a, for a serious gift. So, but appreciate you. Thank yeah, you we do really appreciate you, brother. Thank y'all.
Let me seats again as we go back into some more worship. Um, yeah.
So, you know, it's your favorite duo out here. But I'm not, I'm not much of a talker, and this man is, so I'm going to let him finish. So I'm going to let – sit down. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him finish up, but, you know, it's your favorite duo, so just had to come out here. <laughs> Good morning, my Antioch Church family. Just wanted to come out here for our youth to say welcome again and thank you for coming. You are not, if you're visiting, thank you for coming, but you're now family. So what we're going to do now, we're just going to say thank you for coming and letting us come and sing again for one more youth Sunday. So now, can you just greet your neighbors just with a handshake or one of your smiling faces? <laughs> What's up, my man? Good morning again. So we, as crazy and as full as this service is, we, I wanted to give time to a special um, ministry in this town that means a lot to me. Um, and so I wanted to give Stephanie from My Life Matters an opportunity to come and present the high school ministry part of My Life Matters. We know a lot about the elementary school. We know a lot about the middle. But high school tends to be the, the lesser of the three, and it is just as important. So um, I wanted to give her an opportunity to come and present to get you all to think and to pray about how you could help support not just the high school, but My Life Matters as a, as a whole. But I wanted to give her an opportunity to present the high school ministry of it as well. So I'm going to um, bring up and invite my friend Stephanie Bowen to come and uh, speak about the high school ministry of My Life Matters. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Is it on? How do I cut it on? Hello? Hello? Oh, there it is. There it is. Um, well, Mr. John getting baptized this morning just brings me home to talking about it does not matter how old you are. Amen. So that was perfect. That was all God. That was perfect. Um, so first off, I want to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. I look around and I see lots of familiar faces and, and lots of things that make me comfortable. Um, but first off, before I start, <clears throat> I do not know if you guys know how fortunate you are to have Drew here in this church. He is a wonderful brother to me in Christ. He helps me tremendously, and he loves these kids with all he's got. So if you are fortunate enough to have a youth that serves under him, man, you are blessed. And so um, I think you guys should give Drew a round of applause. <clears throat> Look, this is funny. I saw um, David and Missy in the grocery store one Sunday after church, and we had both been to Subway, and then we were in Food Line, and I said, y'all look so cute, dressed alike. And he said, same team, same uniform. And I thought that was so good. And I went home, and I said, Pat, do you want to dress like me and go to church next Sunday? He said, no. <laughs> and then I got here this morning, and Drew and Shannon are dressed alike. Isn't that cool? That's so cool. Um, so, again, let me introduce myself. So, I was born here in Roxboro. My maiden name is Clayton. So, some people will be like, that girl looks familiar. I do. I look just like my mama. Um, and I'm proud of that. And my uncle, I don't know where he's at. My uncle Gary Clayton, he's in the back. He is one of your deacons here. That's my uncle. So, I am proud to be his, his niece. And my Aunt Dana, I love them very much. And I have spoken over 50 churches in Roxboro, and they've never heard me speak till today. So I said, I hope I don't embarrass y'all. <laughs> I might, I don't know. Um, but I'm married to Patrick Bowen. I've been married for 27 years. I got married when I was 15. Um, just playing. <laughs> yeah, I was a teenager though. Um, we have three children. Our oldest is 22 years old. She just graduated ECU, 
got her degree in nursing and this past week started her dream job in pediatric nursing at Duke. So I'm super proud of her. Um, and she moved out of my house, so that's an added blessing. <laughs> Nobody told me raising and having adult children was so hard, but it is. A, somebody needs to write a book on that, I'm just saying. Um, and then we have Ava. Ava will be 18 in December. She's a senior at RCS. They are two totally different children with two extraordinarily different gifts. But Ava has the, the gift of not taking no for an answer. She's going to ask you over and over and over again. Um, and so that gets annoying to mama, but it's good when she's asking her friends, hey, come to church, hey, come to youth, hey, come to My Life Matters, because no matter how many times they say no, she don't care. She's going to keep on asking. Um, and then we have a seven-year-old son. He'll be seven in September, so he's six right now. His name is Carter. Carter came to us through years of prayer. Um, my husband and I do foster care here in Roxburgh. We have for almost 10 years. So we adopted Carter um, through the foster care system. He, we got him when he was eight weeks old. Um, he has been a blessing and an answer to our prayers. And we also have a little girl right now that is in foster care. We're taking care of, we'll just call her Elle. Um, baby Elle is 11 months old. And we've had her since the day she left the hospital. And we took care of her for five weeks while she was in the NICU fighting to get off drugs. And so I'm a huge advocate for life from beginning to the end. Um, scripture's clear. It tells us we're supposed to minister to the orphans and the widows. So I'm also on the board of Life Choices here in Roxboro, which is new for me. Um, but that's where it begins, right there in the beginning, right there in that mama's belly. And so um, those are some of the things I do. I've been at My Life Matters for almost 11 years, be 11 years in December. Um, I've only ever worked with high school. I've never switched around. That was the one that God called me to, and that's where I've been ever since. And so I don't, I'm not the great, if you ask my students, they'll never tell you, oh, Miss Stephanie's a great teacher. They will never say that. But they will say that I'm a good storyteller and that I can paint a picture to make them understand. And so I want to paint a picture for you guys today, and I wanted to share a little bit about how God called me to that high school level and why sometimes it does get overlooked. And I just looked over and saw Jake. Hey, Jake. Um, I forgot his shower yesterday, y'all. I, I thought it was today. I thought it was today. Um, but anyway, Jake works with middle school at My Life Matters. Jake's one of my very best friends. I love him. Anytime I need anything and my old bones can't pick it up, I say, Jake, and he comes. And so I love Jake. So first off, I was 18 years old the very first time anybody invited me to come to church in Rocksboro, North Carolina. I was 18. There's over 120 churches in this town, y'all. And at 18, that was the only time, the very first time somebody said, come go with me to church on a Sunday. Now, I had been invited to Bible school. I had been to Bible school at a couple of different places with a couple of different friends um, growing up. But my family was all about ball. My daddy played softball. My brothers played baseball. I played baseball and softball and volleyball. So Monday through Friday, we worshiped a sport. And we were at a ball field somewhere. And our suppers consisted of hot dogs and French fries and chips and whatever you could get at the ball field. And I'm not putting my parents down because wherever we went, they went with us. And I mean, wherever we went, they went with us. And I love my parents. But we didn't have dinners around the table. We didn't go to church. And my grandmother, who is Uncle Gary's mom, was in church every time the doors opened. But for some reason, never took any of her grandchildren, to my knowledge, to church. She never invited us, never said, come go with me. So the only time we went to church was a wedding or a funeral, which very much confused me. A wedding and a funeral, right? <laughs> so I'm like, those are the only two times you go to church? Totally confused me. So my husband, we started dating right after we graduated high school. And he's, like I said, his name's Patrick. He's a handsome hunk of man. I love that guy. And um, he says, come on, go with me to church. And we had been dating for about six months. And I said, you go to church? And he said, yeah, you're usually not up by the time I get back. And I was like... <laughs> okay you know and so I said all right I'll go with you one Sunday so knowing two things wedding and funeral I put on my wedding dress because I didn't feel like we were going to a funeral and I put on some pantyhose and a pair of high heel shoes I bought at Roses because that's all I could afford and he picked me up to go to church and he had on a t-shirt and a pair of cargo shorts so I was totally confused I think the t-shirt was like Def Leppard or something and I said are we going to church and he said, yeah, yeah, that's fine. You wear that. You look pretty. I'm wear this. We're going to go to church. So he took me to a church down the road a little ways in Timberlake. And we walked in the building. 
and everybody, and it was a small church, not even half of what's in this church today, but every single person when he walked in the door hugged him and kissed him, and they were so happy to see him. Oh, Pat, we missed you. And I'm like, where have you been? He was like, I was here last Sunday. And I'm like, and they missed you? I mean, it totally confused me. And so I said, okay. So we go to the very front, which was weird because when my, my, I do know my grandma said in the middle. She never said in the front. And I said, why are we going to the front? And he said, that's where my mama sits. That's where mama sit. I said, okay. So we go up to the front, very front, and we sit down. And he says, uh, I said, are all these people related to you? And he said, they're my church family. And I'm like, like every person in here is your family? And he said, they're my church family. And I was like, I had no clue what that meant. And at this church, they stood up and down a lot. And that really confused me. And so they said, please rise and turn in your hymnals to page something, something, something. And I picked up the Bible. And I'm turning to the page number. 18 years old, just graduated high school, but I know I can flip to a page number. And so everybody starts singing. And I'm thinking, no, this ain't no song. And, and Patrick says, Stephanie, that's not the right book. 18 years old, first time I'd ever opened a Bible, ever. And I was like, okay, shut the book, put it down. He picked up the hymnal, he turned to the hymn, and he said, let me show you. And it was a hymn I had heard. I had heard of Amazing Grace. I had heard people sing it. I didn't know it had more than one verse. <laughs> and he says, let me show you how to sing it. And he took his finger, and he showed me how you sing first verse and second verse. And I was like, okay. So then he says, you can sit down. So we sat down, and I'm thinking, whew, that was embarrassing. And about five minutes later, please rise. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, are you kidding me? And so I stand back up. And they were like, at this point, they were telling you to open your Bible, but what do I pick up? The hymnal. <laughs> and I was so embarrassed because I just could not get this right. And he said, Stephanie, it's okay, I'll show you. And he said, it was a psalm, and that's, psalms are my favorite to this day, this is why. He said, the word is the chapter in the book in the Bible. He said, the big numbers of chapter, the little numbers of verse. He said, let me show you how to do it. And so he took his finger, and he showed me how to look up a verse. And I was like, man, this is crazy. And I didn't understand a thing I had read because it was the King James Version. <laughs> and I, but in my hand, I'm holding for the first time in 18 years a Bible. And I'm looking at scripture. And this guy that I have just fell in love with is showing me this. And he's telling me in this building is his church family. And so this, this resounding love is just hitting me hard from all directions. And I love the building. And I just thought, man, this is so beautiful. And in my mind on that very first day, I said, if we ever get married, I want to get married here. And he says, oh, if we get married, we are getting married here. <laughs> he said, I will get married in a church. And I was like, okay. So we had dated about a year, took me to church first time. Six months later, he asked me to marry him. And I said, yes. And um, we started premarital counseling. And the pastor at the time was hot, man. He was on fire for the Lord. He had just graduated college. He was a young guy, um, had a mullet, you know. Um, this was in the 90s. And uh, he was serious about the counseling. We went like almost 10 months. And we went once a month until the last two months. And then we went every week. And so I was in love with Patrick Bowen. But I was really starting to get a crush on Jesus. And I was really starting to feel like that love and people say fall in love with Jesus and the more they talked about love and family and I was like man I want that kind of love I want that kind of love so right before we got married in May I accepted Christ at one of our premarital counseling sessions at that church and we did get married there and for a long time for a little while it was great it was great and so um, got baptized that same December. We got married in May and December 31st on New Year's Eve. Can you believe that's the day I chose to get baptized? And uh, so 19-year-old me got baptized. And my very Southern Baptist grandma came to the service. She was very proud of me, but she was appalled that I wore pants. Because it, we, it was a, a Methodist church, so it wasn't a full, you know, immersion. Since then, I have been baptized that way, though. And uh, so my grandma says, Lord have mercy, what are you wearing, Stephanie? And I said, do you think God cares if I have on pants? I said, don't you think he's happy that I got to this point? And she said, I can't believe you're wearing pants. And she just kept saying it. And I was like, come on, Nanny Coy. You know, and so, um, but anyway, and so I had two brothers, twins to each other, not to me. And they were there the day I got baptized. They were in my wedding when I got married. And uh, I love them both very much. And so got baptized in December. And in April, one of my brothers died. And from December 31st to April, I didn't say a word to anybody in my family 
about Christ. I didn't say a word to anybody in my family about baptism. I didn't say a word to anybody in my family about being saved because I didn't feel like I had the right words. I didn't feel like that I was like qualified. And so I didn't say anything. So the day he died, um, he was in a, a wreck on 158. It's been a long time ago. And uh, we were at the hospital and everybody's in that room. Um, I think Uncle Gary was in that room. And we're in this little chapel at, at Person Memorial Hospital. And I am hysterical. My parents are hysterical. As a matter of fact, my parents couldn't even go identify the body. They came in and said, we need somebody to go identify the body. And so me and my grandfather um, walked down. I don't, did you go with me, Uncle Gary? I feel like you did. Was it you and Papa? I, yeah, that's what I thought. So we go down the hallway to identify my brother's body. I'm 19. He's 17. And uh, that was like one of the hardest things I'd ever done in my life, y'all. And so we get back into the chapel, and I'm looking for my, my husband, and can't, nobody can find him, and I'm, like, getting mad. I'm like, where's Pat? And if you went through all the sheriff's people and all the EMS people and all the teenagers, because it was crazy in there, there was a little kneeling bench, and over on that bench, my husband was on his knees praying. And in that moment, I wanted him to hug me and hold me and, and con caress me and tell me it was going to be okay. And he said, in that moment, I knew I had nothing for you, Stephanie, and all I could do was pray. That man has turned my whole life around for years and years and years. God used him to get to me. And in that moment, when my brother died at 17 years old, the sweetest little fat dude he was, he gave the best hugs, and he was a big old boy. I got mad, and I didn't understand that this loving God that I had fell in love with, how he would let this happen. Because I fell in love with the love of Jesus, but I didn't understand the rest of it. And I was stubborn, and I got mad, and I shook my fist at God, and I said some bad words at God, and I turned my back for a long time. And my husband was patient, and he was kind, and he went to church without me, and he'd come home, and he didn't fuss. And he said, one day, Stephanie, you'll understand. One day, you'll come back to it. And that one day was when I got pregnant with my 22-year-old. Because all of a sudden, it was like the light went off and the scales fell off my eyes. And God said, I'm not mad at you. I see you. I remember you. When Hannah prayed for Samuel and he, she prayed so hard that they thought she was drunk, she, the scripture says, God says, I remembered her. And I felt like God remembered me. And then he wasn't mad at me. He knew my brother was going to pass. He knew what was going to happen and he knew I was going to get mad. And he waited patiently. And he was holding his arms open, and he was still waiting for me. And it didn't matter how old I was. It didn't matter. So as I was pregnant and had the baby, mine and my husband's walk got stronger and stronger and stronger, and we started, like, really walking with Jesus and not just going to church. We started tithing and not dropping a tin in the plate. We started really digging in the Bible and praying together and reading Scripture together. And he, he's not here with me. He usually goes to me when I speak, but he runs the sound at our church. So that's where he's at. He had to be there today. Um, so all of this to say that I started leading the youth at that church, that little country church that I got baptized and married and saved in. And I led the youth there for about seven years. And um, we ended up having our 15-year marriage renewal and all this stuff. And that, that church held me up and raised me up. And they're so sweet. And I adore them. But at some point, God says, time to go somewhere else and serve me somewhere else. And so after 23 years in that church, we left, which was very, very hard. If you've ever left a church to go to another church, you know that that's very, very hard. And so when we're doing all of these things, um, I start volunteering at Youth for Christ. It was Youth for Christ back then. And... I walked into that building with 120 crazy teenagers on a Saturday night, and I felt like there's my family. I felt fine in the chaos. I felt peace in the chaos, and it was all about where God wanted me, not what I was scared of or, or you know, I didn't have the right words or I didn't have the right clothes. Um, and so I, I just jumped right in there. I wasn't scared a bit. I would talk to anybody. I didn't care if they talked back. And, you know, I'd pray with them, and they'd roll their eyes. And I'm like, this is just preparing me for being a parent, you know. And uh, so when I, I knew that God was saying 9 to 5 in an office is not where I want you. So I quit my job. I had worked in for a long time, and I loved. And I didn't have a job for a while. And I was volunteering at Youth for Christ, and so eventually I got hired there. And Tim said to me, he says, you can either work with middle school or high school. And it was like instant, without even thinking, I said high school. And he was shocked. Tim thought I was going to say middle school. 
because my husband volunteered in middle school. And Mark Pickerel is the best thing in the whole wide world. I don't know if you know him, but he's awesome. He's the leader of middle school. So Tim just knew I was going to say middle school, but I didn't. And I didn't even really know why. And so I walked out and went home, and Pat said, well, what did you decide? And I said, I decided high school. And he said, are you crazy? And I said, probably. And uh, he said, well, I, I volunteer with middle school. And I said, well, you keep on volunteering with middle school, but I'm, God really just spit the words out of my mouth. And so I didn't know why, and years go by, and we're at this retreat in the mountains, and this little girl says, hey, Miss Stephanie, how old were you when you, got, um, when you went to church for the first time? I said, 18. She said, how old were you when you got baptized? I said, 19. She said, how old were you when you got married? I said, 19. She said, how old was your brother when he died? I said, 17. What is this? And I was like, what are we playing, 20 questions? And she said, it's something about them teen years with you, ain't it? And I was like, it is. It is. And so it was in that moment with this girl playing 20 questions, literally driving me crazy, um, that I realized that the reason God put me in that age group is because Jesus and the angels rejoice over a 17-year-old or an 18-year-old or a whatever age Mr. John is, just like he does a child or a, tw or a 12 year old or a 13 year old and it took till I was 18 to even be in a church so who are we to discount these high school kids that are lost and broken and from broken homes do you know that like near about every kid now is from a divorced family I mean it is very sad nobody has usually the mother and the father that you know um, gave birth or gave them life and they have so much more to deal with nowadays y'all than we did um, I know I look young, but I'm not. And in the 90s, when I got married, I say I look young because I, I look like my mom. That's a joke. I'm not prideful. Uh, we, you know, we didn't have cell phones to be bullied by. We didn't have, you know, internet and social media to be picked on and prodded and bullied by. We didn't have those things. We got in a fist fight, and the next day you were best friends and eating lunch together again. Right? It's not like that now. It's not like that now. And... I realize that I don't have a bunch of degrees. I don't have any degrees. I have a high school diploma. I don't have letters at the end of my name, and I don't need it because God says, if I call you to it, I'll get you through it. And he said, I want to use you right where you are to speak to these kids. I didn't speak to my brother from January to April, and he died. And at 17, I had never been in a church, so I don't know if anybody had ever shared the gospel of Jesus with him. And I had the opportunity, and I did not do it. I didn't do it because I was scared. And I don't know if anybody ever did. I've had people since then tell me that they had, and I hope that they did. And if they didn't, I hope that in that last moment before he took his breath that Jesus says, call out to me, and I hope he did. But if he didn't, when I get to heaven, I'm not going to know it. God's not going to make me suffer like that. And I'm going to rejoice because one kid... One kid in the last 20-some years was saved because I told him about Jesus. And maybe that one kid is going to go on and spread it in 18 more kids. And I pray it's been more than one kid. I mean, I'd be really bad if it wasn't. <laughs> but I don't know, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, but statistics do show us, and, and a lot of people are all about statistics, that you're supposed to get them young that you, you want to get them young. And we do. We start at third grade at My Life Matters. And you guys, like Drew said, have been amazing supporters at My Life Matters. Y'all volunteer, you serve, you give your money. I don't have to get up here and tell y'all, oh, we raise our salary. I don't have to get up here and tell y'all we need stacks. I don't have to get up here and tell y'all that we, you know, need donations. You know that. You guys have been serving My Life Matters for a long time. But what I wanted to paint the picture of is that it doesn't matter if they're third grade or they're 12th grade. Jesus is still waiting, and he's still got his arms open to them. And we can't forget the older kids just because they're older. Yes, they're loud. Yes, they're dumb. They do crazy things, and they make mistakes. But tell me when a day you were breathing, you didn't make a mistake. Tell me a day that you don't sin. There's not a day, y'all. On this side of heaven, there's not a day that we're going to be perfect until we get to heaven. And so we have to remember that. When you look in these crazy teenagers' eyes, is some behind me? Arik, I'm just playing. Um, <clears throat> I love him. I love him. You know, when you look in these kids' eyes, you can't look and say, oh, oh, they're, they're messed up. They're on drugs. I know they partied last night. Da, 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 da. When you look in their eyes, you should say, 
I have Jesus in my heart. They were created by the Father in his image, just like me. And God's not done with them yet. And we need to love these kids because I don't have the magic words. I don't have, like I said, I don't have these crazy, crazy good things that I can do for them. But what I can do for them is I can allow them to sit in my car and take them to McDonald's. I can invite them to come to church, and if they come, great. If they don't, that's okay, too. But I'm going to invite them because nobody invited me. Nobody. 120 churches in Roxburgh, and I'm 18 before I set foot in one, unless it was a wedding or a funeral. That's a statistic that I will never forget. And in 1 Timothy, I love when Paul is teaching him how to go and do things. And so I just wanted to end with, with this little... Um, just a tidbit out of 1 Timothy chapter 4. He says, Until I get there, focus on reading the scriptures to the church, encouraging the believers, and teaching them. So until till Jesus gets here, if you claim to know him, that's my job, that's y'all's job too. And maybe it's just one kid, maybe it's your next door neighbor, maybe it's a niece, maybe it's a nephew, maybe it's somebody in the youth group that you just like, just think they're the best thing and you're just going to love on them. It doesn't have to be through My Life Matters, but I just encourage you to encourage them because not everybody has a good mom and daddy. Not everybody has one at all. Um, this, these little foster babies, man, you, I can tell you stories after stories. I know Eric used to have um, him and Carrie were here with foster children. It's, it's insane. And you cannot say, you cannot say, I'm pro-life, but then not take care of the kids. You can't. You cannot say, I believe God made them but I'm not going to help take care of them because they're not my responsibility. Because if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus says, take the love I'm giving you and let it overflow into somebody else's life. So pick a kid. And if they're in third, fourth, fifth grade, do it. That's awesome. But don't forget the teenagers, y'all. Don't forget them. Because God will rejoice over their salvation just like he rejoiced today when he was baptized. It does not matter. And by the way, good job. When I saw his foot go up, I thought, holy moly. When I saw that foot go up, I thought, oh, he done lost it now. But he did good. Good job. Good job. Um, so I'm, I'm not even going to tell you, you know, all about the programs and all that. You guys know that. If you do want to know more about it, you can talk to me later. Um, but I wanted to paint this picture for y'all of if at 18 nobody had ever invited me to church, then I wouldn't be 16 plus years in ministry now. If eight, at 18 somebody hadn't taught me how to open the Bible and read it and look at a hymnal, I wouldn't be standing talking to you now. So at 18, praise God that Patrick Bowen had the patience to teach me these things and not turn his back on me because I didn't know what he knew. Because now I know what he knows, and I want everybody to know what we know. So when y'all think about it, pray for those high school students at person. That's the school I'm over. Pray for me and my family because we're in it together. Um, pray for the foster children. Um, and just, just remember... Uh, the crazy lady with short spiky hair who loves the teenagers um, when you pray this school year. And thank y'all so much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, uh, since you guys got a small little break, um, <laughs> can we <laughs> rise again for some more corporate worship? Um, I love hearing you guys' voices, but I know God loves it a whole lot more. So um, let's rise for this thing, Build My Life. <laughs> song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever do We live for you Oh, we live for you Jesus Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Sing holy. Holy, there is. 
is no one like you There is none beside you No open up my eyes in wonder Show me who you are and fill me With your heart and lead me In your love to go
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Well, whoops. <laughs> You know, it's, it's always a wonderful problem to have, isn't it? That you can come here, we can praise God, and then you look at the time and you go, oops. But, you know what? He's going to be glorified in this. Um, so, let me get my stuff together. Welcome. For those that still do not know, I'm the guy that got the bear, um, <laughs> and I am happy. Um, so normally, I've not been known to be a smart man. Typically, it's not what I'm known for. It's one of those things um, that people go, oh, yeah, Drew's smart. Uh, and so, and the reason why I say that is, is most time when it comes to youth Sundays, the smart thing for a youth pastor to do is to just recycle one of his messages from camp. I didn't do that. So, I apologize. Secondly, I was not necessarily known as a smart man because the lessons I chose to do at camp dealt with the attributes of God. If you remember a couple months ago, Dave was like, I don't know why Drew decided to do this. I don't either. But that's what we did. If, you, if you're not familiar with what the youth did this summer, we went to Kentucky. We went to the Creation Museum. We went to the ARC um, experience. And I decided to go through the attributes of God. Now, to set a caveat of that, we went through God's holiness. We went through God's justice and righteousness. We went through God's love, and we went through God's grace. Today, we're, I want to finish these attributes. I did four at camp. I'm going to finish it off with the fifth one for you, and that is God's sovereignty, because this is an, an attribute that I think kind of gets pushed to the side, and it should be a very key one. Um, and so... I want to start with what A.W. Tozer defined God's sovereignty as. A.W. Tozer said this in the opening chapter of the God's sovereignty chapter. says, to say that God is sovereign is to say that he is supreme over all things. There is no one above him. That is, that he is absolute Lord over creation he goes on to say a little bit further in the chapter that God's sovereignty logically implies his absolute freedom to do all that he wills to do. God's sovereignty does not mean that he can do anything. It means he can do anything that he wills to do. The sovereignty of God and the will of God are bound, are bound together. Now I could just pray real quick and we can go home. Not happening. <laughs> So I want to put forth a picture of God's sovereignty. And the best way I can do that is we're going to look through the entire book of Genesis. And I know that y'all looked at the program and like, oh, Drew's just playing with it. He's not. No, we're going through it. Um, but I'm going to do it in the best Drew fashion I can, which is the Drew translation. So hopefully I don't get struck down by any lightning or anything like that. I'll hopefully do this the best I can and the quickest I can. But the, the title of today's message is, I love it when a plan comes together. Um, if you've ever watched the A-Team, you know where this, this slogan came from. If you've never watched the A-Team, it came from the A-Team, and now you can go figure that out from here on out. So, um, but anyway, turn to Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and then I'm going to kind of whisk our way through the rest of the book. Um, and so Genesis 3, m most everyone knows the Genesis story. Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the, the beasts of the field, the birds in the air, the fish in the, in the water. He got water. He got light. He did everything in the first two chapters. Created man, created his helper. All of this is there. And at the end of everything that he created... 
he looked at it and he said it was good. Now, here's the problem with English. Don't give me that look. <laughs> we miss a key, po a key point to the word good. When we look at good, it's like, how was your dinner last night? It was good. But when God said it was good, it wasn't that it was just good. It was perfect. It was pure. And we're going to see in chapter 3 that it is no longer that. So Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 says this. And I will put enmity, can't even speak now, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise, your, bruise you on, your, on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Let's go to the Lord real quick. Father God, get me out of the way. Let it be you that they see, let it be you that they hear. Let it be your word that comes forth right now. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for those that are here to hear it. Open our hearts and our minds to receive your word and receive your truth. That we can better apply it to our lives to continue to grow in our walk with you. Lord, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we have this set up in the context. God created it. We messed it up. And I say we, like we, we, we like to blame Satan for it. You know, he set up everything. He is like, here it is. What did he say? Well, he said, if we eat of this fruit, then, then we'll die. And, and a caveat, when we went to the Creation Museum, I realized that the fruit that they partake of looked like a squid. I have a picture. I'll be more than happy to show it to you. But it was weird. Anyway, so they're, they're eating of the fruit. But Satan didn't give them the fruit and said, and forced it down their throat. He said, if you do this, you won't die. You will be like God. So pride ultimately comes in and takes completely over. You want to know what the original sin is? It is pride. Why? Because we, for some unknown reason, think we can be exactly like God. And we fail miserably. And so God all-knowing, all-powerful, understands that there's a bad situation in the garden, figures, you know, goes down there, knows exactly what's going on, asks them what the deal is, and, they, and Adam's first response was, well, the woman that you gave me gave me the... F Bruh, just own up to it. Like, we always want to blame Eve because she ate first, but if you really think about Adam's choice words, who did he just blame? He blamed God... For the whole situation. Amen. Pride is introduced. So God has a plan. And in that plan, we see it in verse 15. He will bruise the head of the serpent, but the serpent will bruise the heel. And so what happens after that? So we understand the context of the plan. We see that the plan has come together, that God has set forth motion. But then we go to chapter 4. And what is chapter 4 known for? Cain and Abel. So we have, as um, Vody Bauckham kind of put it, and I really liked it, you have the seed of Adam and you have the seed of Satan in this chapter. Because we know the story of Cain and Abel. I don't really necessarily have to go through it. Abel gave his best and God approved. Cain just did what he had to to get by and he didn't. Pride and jealousy now come in. The first murder takes place. Satan wins if it's just relying on Abel to continue on the seed. But what does God do? In verse 25 of chapter 4, we see that Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain had killed him. The plan is still together because the seed is still intact. Then we go a little bit further. 
to chapter 6. Chapter 6, we see the beginnings of Noah. Noah comes into place because the world is what? Wicked above anything. And God's like, I I'm, I'm, I'm wiping it out. But he sets forth a certain family that come from Seth. Seth's family is Noah. Noah gets in his family and his sons and their wives all get on the boat. It's a big boat. I highly recommend going to see the big boat. Massive. God floods the earth, takes away all the wickedness, leaves that line still intact. Noah and his family. We go past chapter 6. We go from Noah. We go to who? We all know this. Who's the next one in line? Abram. Abram from the same line is made a promise from God that he would become the father of many nations. That his descendants would be as the stars in the skies. He gets his name changed and God promises him that he will have a seed. Now here's the issue. Was Abram and Abraham and Sarah patient with this? No. So they tried to help God out. And I'm going to ask this question. I think it's a great caveat. You ever tried to help God out with a situation? It typically doesn't end well. And it doesn't here. You want to see the actual issues between Sarah and Abraham and their choice to help God out? It's still over in the overseas right now, fighting today. But he does fulfill his promise to deliver the seed, Isaac. And then Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And God chooses Jacob to continue on. And then Jacob has uh, 12. So now here comes the tricky part, right? Like, how, where does the seed come from, from the line of Jacob? And this is where we want to kind of be at from here on out. We're going to be in chapter 37, and I'm going to break this down as best I can and as quick as I can because I want y'all to see the beauty of this plan. In chapter 37, Joseph has a dream. And he goes and tells his brothers about the dream. And the dream was basically, you know, in the nutshell, if you want the Drew version, y'all are going to bow to me. Real brothers didn't really like that at all. To say that they were fans of that brother is an understatement. They weren't. And the reason why they're not very big fans of him is not the fact that they had dreams, but the fact that he was the favorite son from the favorite wife. And so he got all the treatment. And they didn't like it. They resented it. So he has another dream. And this time he decides to tell his father about the dream too. And same kind of dream that everybody was going to end up bowing to him. And in fact, his father even rebuked him, briefed him and said, even you, me and your mother are going to do this? And he goes, well, I'm just telling you what the dream said. Oh, you. And so Fast forward a little bit through chapter 37, and the brothers are upset because they see him walking. It's like, let's just get rid of him. They're like, we'll just kill him, be done with it. And then one of the brothers like, no, nah, let's not kill him. And so the first thought I was like, it's like, you know, would they have really done it? Would they have really killed him? And I went back to like 35 and 36 and went, oh yeah, they wiped out an entire like people. <laughs> so yeah, they they would kill kill his brother. And so they they beat him up. They leave him in a pit. Then they decide, hey, we can make some money off of him. So they sell him into slavery. And then all of a sudden, from 37, there's no more Joseph. It becomes Judah in 38. Now my question to you is, you've ever wondered why Judah is in the middle of the story of Joseph? Have you ever thought about it? Because this isn't Judah's high point in life, chapter 38. In fact, it's his very low one. So why is this stuck 
right in the story of Joseph. It isn't just because they're brothers. There's more to this than just that. I'm not going to go into the graphic detail of said chapter 38. I'll let y'all do that on your own. But let's just say Judah didn't go very well. <laughs> it wasn't a good time. Drunkenness had gotten involved. Some weirdness got involved. You can read it on your own. But when I say that this is Judah's low point, it is Judah's low point. 39 and 40, we see Joseph relying on God. He runs from temptation, and in doing so, the, he is placed in prison. He's doing the right things. He's, he's living the best he can. He's trying to honor God. He's getting brought up, and he's basically in control of Potiphar's house. Evidently, he's a good-looking man. Potiphar's wife was like, yeah, you know, y'all know what, you know, you know what she wanted. And... And so he's like, no, I don't want that. And it's a great illustration. If, if you're being tempted by something, do pull a Joseph, run, even if it means leaving evidence that you ran. And so she, Potiphar's wife tells Potiphar what, you know, what he supposedly did. So he's been falsely accused. If that doesn't ring a bell later on, just the FYI, keep that like check. Falsely accused of doing something he didn't do. And so he's placed in prison. Now, I will say this. I, this is just a Drew thing. I could be completely wrong with this. But I don't believe Potiphar believed his wife. And the reason why I don't believe that is because I honestly believe if Potiphar truly believed that he did what she said he did, he would have never made it to prison. Amen. So he understood who Joseph is, but he was in a situation where he had to act. And so he's placed in prison. And in prison, he gets to do an, the same thing he did with his brothers and his fathers and interpret two dreams, the cupbearer and the baker. One, not too bad. Oh, you'll spend a little time in here. You'll go back up. You'll be good. The other one, oh, you're fixing to lose everything, like everything, like head, uh, die, dead. And he told the guy that was fixing to go up, don't, don't, you know, don't forget about me, which he did. He still spends two more years in prison. It's kind of, you know, that's not fun, but he's still doing his thing. Fast forward to 41. 41, Pharaoh has two dreams. And now the guy that Joseph helped get out of prison remembers, oh yeah, there's a dude in prison that knows how to do this. And Pharaoh calls him up. And Pharaoh is like, this is my dream. And Joseph was like, all right, you got seven years of good, and you got seven years of famine coming. And Pharaoh blows up. He's like, I don't know who this man is, but he's my dude now. This is Drew version. Remember that. Don't like, don't like, this is not like, that wasn't in your text. I'm just saying. <laughs> Pharaoh's like, he's my guy. I'm going to put him over everything. The only person that he's going to be under is me. And he gives him a ring. He gets a wife. He gets all kinds of power. He gets to ride in the fancy, like, whatever those things are, chariots. <laughs> or was it the things that, I don't know. He got, he got fancy stuff, all right? He got, he got it all good. Now, here's the thing. Everybody that reads the story of Joseph looks at chapter 41 and goes, here's Joseph's high point. He's made it. He's made it to the promised land, right? He's got power. He's got wealth. He's got everything. Let's continue to read chapter 41 real quick, and we're going to see really quick that this is not Joseph's high point. In fact, I would have to agree with Vodi Bakum on this statement. He stated that we praise Joseph for having a pagan wife, having pagan power, having pagan everything, bowing to a pagan king because that's who he's under the authority of now. But yet when we go to Daniel 1 and we look at the Jews that did the exact same thing, we go, I can't believe they did that. Chapter 41 is not Joseph's high point in life. 
In fact, I have to argue that it is probably his lowest point. And the reason why I can say that, when we go to 41 and we look towards the end in verses 50 and fit through 52, it says this. Now before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar's priest, of own bore to him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh. I'm pretty sure I butchered that, but it's fine. For he said, God has made me forget all my trouble and all of my father's household. And he named the second one Ephraim. For he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The first one, both sons he named Hebrew names. He didn't give them Egyptian names. So he still understands that he is a child of the covenant. And he understands that though he has all of this stuff, he is still in a land of affliction. But he understands that he's still a Hebrew. And he's still one of God's peoples. So it's a very powerful name set. But it is not his high point in life. We get that confused. That if we just stay faithful, God is going to give us everything that we need. Joseph's story proves otherwise. To define the two names, I'm going to go with what Vodi Bakum said for the first one. And he said the very first one was, I learned to let that stuff go. You rejected me. You falsely accused me. You tried to kill me. I learned to let that go. Keep that statement in your mind as we fast forward a little bit more. In 42 through 44 of the book of Genesis, we see the brothers go to Egypt. The famine has in, and they need food. And so Jacob sends the brothers there. Joseph recognizes the brothers now remember, 38, we have Judah in his low point. We see now Judah stepping in as, an, as the leader of his brothers, taking position because Joseph wants to see Benjamin. And so to see Benjamin, Benjamin has to go. And Jacob didn't want Benjamin to go because Benjamin's the last son of the favorite wife. And so he doesn't want him to go. And so Judah's like, if anything happens to him, I will take his place. I will step in and be that sacrifice. In 38, he was at his lowest in 44, he's the rescuer for his brother. And we see in 45, Joseph finally reveals himself because Joseph sets up everything, you know, puts the, the silver cup in, in Benjamin's bag. They, he's doing all the tricks. I think Joseph's just like puppet. Like he was like, yeah, I got y'all this time. I'm gonna, I, might, I might love y'all and I might have forgiven y'all, but I'm going to at least play with y'all for a little bit. Like... <laughs> You know, we don't really see Joseph, quote unquote, sin, but we understand that no one is perfect except for Christ. Amen. And words, sometimes you don't see the tone. Like, we don't know how he presented the dreams to his brothers. Like, ha y'all going to bow to me. We don't know what he said. And I guarantee you, he had a little bit like, yeah, I forgive y'all. I'm messing with y'all for a little bit. And so he does this. Judah steps in. is like, if you take him, you will kill my father. He is pleading for his brother, and he's pleading for his father. And Joseph finally cannot handle it anymore, and he sends everybody out, and he breaks down in tears, and he says, I am your brother. And there's this beautiful reconnection of the 11 brothers to the 12th brother, who they thought they, he's gone. And we set this whole situation up. 
this fast forward through the book of Genesis to get to the key scripture that I want to actually read. In Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 20, it says this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong which we had did to them? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgressions of your brothers and their sins, for they did wrong, did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servant of God and your father. And Joseph wept. Then when they spoke to him, then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I, for I am I in God's place. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Jacob dies and his brothers are worried. Oh man, he's fixing to get us. So they sent a messenger. Most likely, it was either Benjamin, the one brother that had nothing to do with it, or the even better one, Judah, who is now the head of the household. And we cannot miss that fact that Judah is in this place. Verse 20, Joseph said that you meant evil. God intended it for good. You did this, but God used it so that you could be saved. God moved the, places, the pieces around and lined it up so that they could stay intact from the moment Genesis 3.15 was spoken to Genesis 50 verse 20, there has been a scarlet thread and a puzzle that fit perfectly together. We don't understand those purposes. We don't understand the pieces and how they fold together. I'm sure Joseph spent many years going, why am I here? And then there's a payoff. And when he sees that payoff and understands that he just say he helped the ability to save his father and his brothers and his family and his people. It is not just this wonderful story of prospering out of affliction. It is to show you that God's plan of rescue and redemption starts from the very beginning of time, that there was this time that there was someone that says, I love them and I'm going to bring them back to me. And how am I going to do this? You don't know how it's going to happen, but I promise you that it is going to make sense in the long run. There is rescue and hope through that. The deception from all the brothers and the faithfulness of Joseph, the changed heart of Judah. Why is this an important piece of Scripture? Because we see the Gospel from Genesis 3 to Genesis 50. We see a man at his low point, cannot get any lower. The fornication, the sins, the everything that Judah went through. And it's not the house of Joseph that goes on. Show me in the Bible where you see the house of Joseph anymore. But you see the house of Judah. Because Judah had a grandson. It's a great, 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 great grandson. You might have heard of him. His name was David. David comes onto the scene as a little boy, hearing a giant talk straight trash, and goes, no, this ain't happening. Boldly, faithfully walks down and says, I don't know who you are, but I know who my God is. David comes in, not only slays the giant, but rescues his people. 
Because what was Goliath's ultimatum? Send me a man, we'll fight. I kill him, you serve us. He kills me, we serve you. David shows us rescue and redemption. But the story continues from that same line of Judah. Because David had a great, 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 and his name was Jesus. Amen. And he is the ultimate rescuer and redeemer. Set forth in a plan all the way back in Genesis, all the way to the Gospels. Of hope and rescue, knowing that we are at our lowest point Yet there is a plan of redemption for every person that believes on the name of Christ. And it's interesting because Genesis 50 verse 20 resembles another passage in the book of Acts. Paul, I mean Peter, good gracious, Peter in the second greatest sermon in the Bible, first one being the Beatitudes, that was Jesus. You think there's a better preacher than Jesus, that's on, that's on y'all. I, Jesus is the best to me. Peter probably laid down the best one after him. Over 3,000 people came to Christ because of this message. And here's what got the people in their feels, in their feelings, for those that didn't understand that. Acts chapter 2, 23 and 24 says this. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. 24. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Somebody asked me, she's like, why are you dressed like a funeral? (laughs) Death got killed. And the power of sin was destroyed. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3. This is the sovereignty of God. This is the holiness of God. This is the justice and righteousness of God. This is the love and the grace of God. Paul summed all of this up in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed. That is Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, we serve a God with a plan. He is not sporadic. He is not wishy-washy. He is a God that stands on his promises, stands on his word, and delivers what he says he's going to do. Though we are imperfect because of our sin, he set forth the plan to save and redeem us. I love it when the plan comes together. And I love it when I'm able to see it in the very first book. We didn't have to go to the Gospels to see his redemption. We get to see him use people And those people show us what his son was fixing to do. If you do not know this redeemer and this rescuer tonight, today is the perfect time. If you do know him, rejoice in that fact. Colton and Shana are fixing to come back up here in a second for the invitation. And it's a fitting song. Jesus, we love you. Now, I would love to hear every voice singing it. 
But more importantly, I would love to know that every voice in here knows that God that has a plan. So David will be up here. I will be up here. If you need to talk, great. But man, what a Savior and a God we serve. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for an opportunity we can be here. And Father, thank you that you have a plan. Lord, left up to our own things, we would fall short and fail miserably. But because you know the exact things, Lord, you are in control. So Father, bless this time. Thank you for all that you're doing. And Lord, be glorified from here on out. In your name we pray. Amen. Things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. The things that we thought were dead are breathing in life. Again, you cause your sun to shine on darkest night. For all that you've done, we will pour out our love. This will be our anthem song. And Jesus, we love you. Adore. The hopeless I found their hope. The orphans now have a home. All that was lost has found its place in you. And you lift our weary. You make us strong instead You took these rags and you made us beautiful For all that you've done we will pour out our love This will be our anthem song Cause Jesus we love you Oh, how we love you, you are the one our hearts adore, and oh, Jesus, we love you, oh, how we love you, you are the Thank Drew and the youth today for leading us in worship. We realize we busted your lunch plans, but how else could he preach through the whole book of Genesis? <laughs> with how, but, uh, and not to truncate our worship, but we do uh, we do have something else that we need to take care of. So I sort of nodded the Colton off there for a moment. I'm going to have him come down front. I'm going to have you be seated for just a moment just to pick on Stephanie because she said, man, I went to that church and it was up and down, up and down. Up and down. <laughs> but, but no, seriously, we learned that one. what a special day to see God use our youth, our Amen. youth pastor, to do what they're doing. Now, if you haven't recognized, our youth program is thriving and it's growing. And it's not easy working with teenagers um, because they're sort of like cats. It's harder to wrangle them. They're here one second somewhere else the next. 
because of the energy. But we love our youth here at Antioch Baptist Church more than we have words to say. We understand that they are our future, and they're also a big part of our present. But uh, in order to sort of serve them well, we've always sort of had different positions here. We've got a pastor, and they let me do that by the grace of God, and I love it. We've got an associate pastor in Pastor Glenn. We've got our youth pastor in Pastor Drew. But for years, we've had an associate youth pastor. We haven't tried to fill that job here since Drew moved up into the youth pastor's job because we didn't want to just pick somebody. We wanted God to present to us that perfect situation, which he has. Uh, to my right is Mr. Colton Slaughter. You've heard him today. You've seen him, and he's got the coolest Hawaiian shirts on the planet. <laughs> Except for there's a really cool one back there that I picked on earlier today. But um, we wanted to present to you, and this is myself as staff and the entire deacon body wanted to present to you, Mr. Colton Slaughter, as a candidate for you to vote on as our associate youth pastor. Then what he becomes is Drew's right arm. He's already been that as our youth intern, <laughs> but today I need a vote, so I need a first, and I got it from a Brian Smith. I got it second from Miss Janet Newsom. All in favor, would you just yell out amen? Amen. Does anybody don't want him to say amen? I will hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> we knew it would be this way, so we welcome him on the staff today, and you guys love on him, but also love on Drew and Shana. I'm going to go to the back and we'll be out on the front porch today, but you guys love on Drew and Shana and Colton today more so, and we love you. We hope you have a wonderful week and that God will bless you in big ways. Please pay special attention to the announcements in your bulletin. There are some big ones, and if you are interested at all in helping with our newly named Antioch and Friends, and we're calling it Saturday Night Special this year, which will be September 17th, and a play that will be put on at that point, Please hang out in the sanctuary. We're going to meet Jim on this side. All right, so we'll meet right up here to the left. Just hang out. We need folks. You, if, look, if you don't want to read anything, it's okay. But if you can help in any way, please stay back and meet with Jim and the fan, uh, Pastor Glenn and anyone else that will be helping with that. But y'all love on these guys. Welcome aboard. Anything you'd like to say, buddy? Um, probably. Um, <laughs> not like you didn't know this was coming I mean, yeah, but So yeah, I was just writing down I was writing down a bunch of things You know, different things I was going to say And then I kept thinking about like Oh, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, 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 and this But, you know, while I would love to do a lot of things I have, you know, planned out In my head, you know Talking about the Lord's sovereignty It is just something That's not up to me um, You know, I'm you know, I love to serve, I love you guys, I love serving in the youth, um, and just, you know, seeing the world, seeing, like, the shallow Christianity, and seeing, um, like David talked about yesterday, truth even being um, argued upon as to what's right and wrong, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm really, really tired of it, and I'm just at a point where I want the real thing, um, I just want the heart of the Father, I want the love from the Son to be moved by the Spirit, so thank you guys for um, having me all these years to get to this point. Um, yeah, that's it. All right. <laughs> Here in a second. All right. Amen. David Robinson is dying to close us in prayer today. So, David, would you do that? And as he closes us in prayer, we're going to exit to the back. Drew's coming with me. Colton's coming with me. Shana's coming with me. And I'll just be out on the porch hanging out in case you just decide you want to speak. But love on these guys. Yeah, well, she'll be with me always. Same thing. But anyway, Brother David, would you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this wonderful day of worship we've had here this morning. We thank you for each and every moment. And Lord, we just ask that as we leave here, we take you with us. And we spread your word around to everybody we see, not only today, but the rest of this week and each and every day thereafter. We thank you again. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.